Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Sanity's Cove YouTube channel. So glad you're here. Um, if you're watching via uh, the YouTube channel, please like and subscribe, and we'll have more uh, interviews with interesting people in the weeks to come. So uh, I'm with somebody who is who's very interesting for a whole number of reasons. But one of the most interesting things, first of all, is her name, um, because I'm still working on how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, it's Simha Natan, I believe. Uh, she's almost, she's almost <laughs> close enough. And uh, and she is uh, coming to us from Israel. She is so she is Israeli. Yeah. Um, and it, she, well, let me see. I, I'm going to let her introduce herself. Uh, she is an author. She is involved in a very interesting community in the north of Israel. I came across her book uh, maybe about three years ago. Uh, I don't know if you can see on my Kindle here, but it's um, uh, Dare to Ask. And uh, the subtitle is Wrestling from a Place of Rest in Our Pursuit of God, which is kind of a, a, you know, an interesting subtitle there. One, we're called to rest in God, but also there's a wrestling and a pursuit. And how do those things come together? So uh, I found it just uh, wonderfully contemplative, kind of a, a book that would inspire me to pray more. Okay, so and it, and I found it applicable to kind of whatever denomination you might be from. So if you're from a more reformed background or charismatic background or you know Baptist Presbyterian, uh, it, it was kind of written in a very accessible way. Some books come across very denominationally specific. Mm -hmm. uh, this was kind of wide open and um, and yeah, like I said, I I, oft, I found myself reading different readings and thought, no, I want to go pray now. Um, and I think that's a, a sign of a good book. Um, if it inspires you to spend more time with the Lord. So, uh, welcome. Thank you uh, so much for having me. Oh, uh, it's great. What a treat. <laughs> so, um, uh, Simha, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe just a brief introduction, where you live, how long you've been there, what do you do? Well, sure. I am uh, Simha is my name. Uh, I'm originally from the UK. We emigrated to Israel about 10 years ago. Um, husband's from London. Um, we have three kids, two of them born in the UK. We moved when they were basically babies and uh, had another one here. Um, yeah, we live in a little town near Caesarea, which is a real treat. Um, it's, you know, I'm not, I don't take it lightly that I have that as my <laughs> backyard. Um, and we live right on the foothills of the Carmel Range. So out, my, my road is the first road in our town. So our view is literally the start of the mountain, which is really beautiful. We've got olive groves and, mount, and mountains and vineyards all around us. Um, yeah, we have a, we're in a really small town, but we have 16 wineries. So very clear what the priorities are in our, in our town. <laughs> Um, what do I do is a very difficult question to answer because I seem to just juggle multiple things and spin many plates. But um, my time is basically split between two things. First of all, I am on the leadership team and coordinator for our worship program, mm -hmm. um, which is called Ascend. Um, and that is um, a, a work that we do um, in our community and, and as partners with many, many other communities, congregations and houses of prayer across Israel. We run conferences for Israeli worshipers. We do training, masterclasses, conferences. And then we have our big 10 day program, which is where you are all invited to come and connect with what's going on in Israel. And it's a program. Yeah, that please tell us, tell us lots about this. So if someone's watching yeah. in the UK or America Australia right now what what's this thing you're running okay well the 10 day program is like the um, global touch point to the local yeah. um, so we we invite the nations to come and we usually have about 65 people on the program um, we work really hard to make it a family feel and you're invited into essentially our family because it actually is people who run the program that are doing daily life together actually three of us live on the same street yeah. so um yeah. it's really inviting you in mm -hmm. and we basically have a 10-day journey and we call it a transformation of the heart it's a worship journey yeah. but we have six different tracks that you can you can get involved in where you break down into smaller groups and focus on that more 
So we have prayer ministry, work, musical worship, creativity, leadership and management, dance, and we're also looking into a couple of other options as well. So you can really touch uh, base with something that's really your passion and driving force, but still go on this journey. We walk through three stages. We look at accessing his presence and hearing the voice of God. Um, we look at a pure heart and um, what it means to actually go up that mountain, like the Bible says, with, and yeah. who can ascend the hill of the Lord and what is a pure heart anyway. Yeah. And then once you've achieved that, uh, you, you know, how do you go out and take ground in authority? How do you um, walk out your calling? And so this, this 10 days is um, an amazing place for people to connect locally with ministries all over the country but also to have a real encounter with God over 10 days, which we've seen just is amazing to watch. So. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. So uh, what we're going to do um, now, I'm, I'm going to ask Simha a couple questions about uh, what's happening in Israel with the uh, coronavirus, uh, as well as what's happening in the church scene. And then uh, she's already begun to explain a little bit of what, her work is doing, but she also has a writing project coming up that I want to uh, ask her about. So first of all, the the coronavirus response, this really hasn't made the news over here. Um, oh, it, it, it wouldn't. You know, it never, it never would from Israel. <laughs> yeah, but you guys have handled the coronavirus just in terms of, you know, people dying from it. The statistics in Israel are really remarkable. I mean, like yeah. shockingly remarkable. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Yes, I, I am incredibly proud. Actually, it's been really hard for us to watch the UK and be in Israel and just see the completely different responses. Um, first of all, we went into lockdown very, very early and very, very strictly, much earlier on than the UK did, um, and we were in complete lockdown um no no nothing outside of supermarkets really was was available or open um and we we've been doing that for it must be about 70 days already by now um and only now it's starting to open kids are starting to go back to school now so kids um, are going back really, to school now yeah, yeah yeah this week they're going back yeah okay. um but we've only had 268 deaths Wow. Um, and I, I, I have been looking into what they've been doing because it, it doesn't make sense. Like you said, it's, it's a little bit mm, how they've done this because they've had a lot of cases. There's been yeah. tens of thousands of cases, but just no deaths. Yeah. And so the key, the key things that we've, I've seen that they've been doing is, is first of all, every single patient who's been admitted into a hospital has had 24 hour one on one care. Okay. They've not been left on a ward. They've had a person who is on hand 24 hours a day to tweak mm -hmm. the care. Yeah. And the second thing is they haven't been using ventilators. Okay. They've, they've no hardly ventilators. used any. Okay. I mean, I, I know from my own personal, you know, our story, we've, we actually lost a family member a couple of weeks ago to COVID in the UK and it was the ventilator that finished him off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I know there's a kind of catch 22, you know, they need help with breathing and ventilator does that, but it also can totally decimate their insides, which is what happened to our family member. So they've been a lot more yeah. sparing with use of ventilators here. Um, I've heard this we, on one hand, you know, with ventilators, when it first broke out, everyone was saying, oh, we need more ventilators. Yeah. But then later you hear, well, people, well, I, I don't know all the complexities of it, but, um, they're it's very aggressive it, breathing with the ventilator and then when you take them off they, they they almost don't know how to cope without one yeah and it's a very aggressive breath that is taken yeah. in so yeah. what happened to our family member was it perforated his lungs and then you know mm. it, it was just it was too hard the breath the breath was too hard so i don't know i'm not a medical expert yeah. but i do yeah. know i do know in israel that the well, it's been a slightly different no approach. ventilators mm. <laughs> Okay, well, fantastic. It, I, again, that's just remarkable, and you know, that's just the blessing of God to um, to have so few deaths. Uh, yeah. in, you know, where so many people were getting it. So, thank God for the wisdom He's given those Israeli doctors. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so next question, you know, I think whenever we talk to anyone from Israel, people are always curious, well, what's the, the church scene? What are the Christian communities like? Like what's happening? Are, are Christian communities growing? Are people coming to faith? Is, is it hard? Is there persecution? How would you explain to someone in Britain and America or anywhere in the world sort of what is the, what is the Christian scene like there? Yeah, the Christian scene here is, um, well, really, it's interesting that you use the word Christian, because I think what the way I would say is that there is a Christian world and a Messianic world. Okay. There's, there's a lot of Christians, non-Jewish, okay. that live here, a lot of Americans um, that, that, that are here, and they are, they're very Christian, and there are churches, and there are very Christian gatherings, but there's also a Messianic movement, which is more indigenous Israelis and is a more Jewish expression mm -hmm. of, um, of Christianity or of Judaism, depending which way you come at it. Okay. Um, so as a Jew myself, I would, I would say that my, my Jewish faith was completed yeah. uh, by, yeah. by belief in Messiah rather than I converted away, yeah. which I think is how a lot of people view it as a conversion away. Certainly the religious Jews view it as a conversion. Yeah. Um, so, but in terms of the, the indigenous body in, in the country, it's massively growing, um, not, not in the ways that um, Western churches may like to see, because a lot of it is in home groups and yeah. through relationship and friendship. And, and in Israel, family is so important in the culture. On a Friday night, you will find every household having a family meal or gathering with friends. It's just wow. absolute bog standard culture. You just, that's what happens to every home every week. If you walk around a neighborhood on a Friday night, everyone's in, everyone's eating, everyone's having a barbecue, everyone's drinking wine. Every, it's very much, you do it every week. Yeah. And so that's the setting that you bring people in. That's how people meet, how people gather Mm -hmm. And recently, actually, there was a survey done across the country about to all the believers, well, all the ones they know of, um, asking them, do you go to a big congregation? Do you go to a home group? Which do you think is more important? Which do you prioritize? And they expected for people to be all about the big congregations. Mm -hmm. And they found that in the, in the survey, the majority of people were saying, we don't go to a big congregation. Mm -hmm. We only go to a home group and we don't think the big ones are necessary okay. or at least a priority. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so for us, we also are in the same position. We don't, we don't go to a, a large congregation. There is no large congregation anywhere near us for about yeah. 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, so we are a small home group based community yeah. that does its stuff. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. That's very insightful. And it's, I think, very um, uh, hopeful to know that, um, you know, that um, belief in the Messiah is, is growing. Uh, there. Well, what's, what's amazing is that, you know, when we moved here 10 years ago, I remember um, we're very closely connected to a large congregation in Haifa, which is about 40 minutes away. Yeah. Um, and one of their founding pastors said years and years and years ago, he said, you know, you'll know the Messiah is nearly coming back when it's the taxi drivers and the hairdressers that are talking about Yeshua. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not like the big shot, whoever, the, 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 the little, the groundwork, you know, the, the yeah. people on the ground. Yeah. And, and that was not happening at all when we moved here 10 years ago. There yeah. was a lot of resistance. Yeah. Um, people were not open about talking about anything. And yeah. over the last 10 years, it's done, totally reversed. Yeah. People wow. are so open, yeah. so eager, yeah. and they're figuring it out by themselves. We have had three couples in our, in our local community show up and be like, I was reading the law, I was reading the Torah, yeah. and I just realized, it's Yeshua. Whoa. Right? Am I right? Am I right? And it's like, they're just bing on yeah. their own. So they need a lot of discipling and they need a lot of, you know, undoing of religion. Yeah. But, yeah. but it is really amazing to see people just showing up without having had, they've not gone through an alpha course. They've not yeah. been to church or, you oh, know, just, come on, Holy yeah. Spirit. That's just, beautiful. yeah. Um, a, two two final questions one is 
so um, you know, I, and I don't know the answer to this because though we've communicated uh, online over the last three years, this is the first time we're actually having a conversation yeah. uh, face to face, if you will. Um, and that is your background. Did, did you grow up Jewish or did you come from a Christian family or a Jewish family? Did you have a, a time when you came to faith in Messiah? What was your story? Think, well, my yes. Uh, to all of those questions, the answer is yes. Um, I, my mom, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors and they actually became believers during the Holocaust through a German in wow. Hungary. Wait, wait, wait. During the Holocaust... <laughs> Your Jewish grandparents came to faith in Messiah yeah. through Germans. Through, through German in Hungary. In Hungary. Wow. That's unique. Yeah. That's, a, that's a niche story right there. Right. So my mom, uh, they emigrated to, they actually fled uh, the revolution in um, 1956 and came yeah. to London. And my mom was seven at the time. So... They, at that point, left Judaism behind yeah. and really did not want to rehash all of that trauma yeah. and had found faith. So they kind of just became Christian. Yeah. And it was my mom and my dad before we were born that kind of rediscovered, actually, they don't, they're not separate. They actually go yeah. together. One completes the other. And so I was raised very much knowing I'm Jewish, but we believe in Jesus. Yeah. And... So we celebrated the feast, Passover, and yeah. you got the Day of Atonement, and, but we also did Christmas, and we also went to church. My father was a pastor most of my life, and so I was brought up very much with both um, yeah. at home. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, my next writing project will probably be on uh, uh, Hadassah and Mordecai, or the Book of Esther, and so I'm trying to learn up a lot about uh, Pur the Festival of Purim, at the moment right uh, now that's an interesting one i'm, I'm it seems like a cross between christmas and halloween and a few other little oh, topics together so, so many things wrong with that one uh, yeah, lots of alcohol lots of alcohol oh yeah <laughs> a lot of drinking lots, lots of alcohol if you recognize people you've done it wrong yeah <laughs> <laughs> blessed be mordecai cursed be Haman, and you just um, good snacks they do good snacks at purim yeah <laughs> Final question. Um, oh, so I just mentioned my uh, upcoming writing project. So uh, you're coming up with, uh, we've already mentioned um, Dare to Ask, which uh, if uh, you're interested in reading more, please check this out. It's on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. Uh, but you're beginning another writing project. Anything you can tell us about that? Yeah. Um, well, you, you know, <laughs> well, there's kind of already more. Um, yeah. There, you know, off the back of Dare to Ask came three 30-day devotionals and CDs that go with that part of that whole project. Um, so, so I said earlier, half my time is split between Ascend and the other half is spent on all these other things. Um, the first of which is a new podcast that's just been launched and that's, I think, halfway through the first season now. So that's, What's that called if we want to look it up? It's called The Stripped Hole Podcast. The Stripped Hole. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, that's kind of my bridge between moving out of Dare to Ask World and into the next book. Okay. The next book is, um, is called Find Me Hidden. Find Me Hidden. And, okay. Right. And it is really just exploring uh, the treasures that are in the hidden places. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I've, um, I've learned both through Dare to Ask, which I think is a, a central theme of Dare to Ask, but also more so through coming out of that season, is just how many treasures that God has for us in whatever season it is that we're in. Yeah. And we're very quick to dismiss bad seasons mm -hmm. um, as just, I've got to just get through it. Yeah. And, and we don't sit and actually receive the treasures that are in that place because there is always growth to happen and there is always some way that God wants to grow us so he can trust us with more. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, as part of this new season, whatever that is, um, you know, I've, I've launched coaching. Um, it's interesting that you're talking about beauty. One of those things is about beauty coaching okay. and, um, and also retreats, um, running retreats for people. Um, there's going to be hopefully 
one in November in Turkey um, okay. for people to just come rest and wrestle um, for more. So yeah, does fantastic. that answer the question? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. So watch this space, look for the podcast. Um, please, if you're seeing this through Facebook, uh, you know, Simha is a, is a great person to follow, so you can get more news by following her. Um, are you still on Twitter? I don't do Twitter. I, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm no. Instagram and Facebook. Inst yeah, me. you do a lot on Instagram. So uh, yeah, please. and YouTube as well. I have a YouTube channel. You, you have YouTube, great. I didn't know that. Yeah, my my podcast actually on YouTube. So if you don't have a podcast app or are into that, you can just do it on you on YouTube. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, I found this very interesting. Hopefully uh, people listening have as well. Good to hear a word, particularly from Israel, as well as one um, where we're being stirred to, to worship and to pray and to, to be more with the Lord. So uh, Sima, it's been a great pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. It's been great. Bye.